Hey everyone, Matthew Doyle here with a new tutorial for you guys on how to use NVIDIA's Apex Cloth with Stingray 1.3 and Maya or Maya LT because they work basically the same. It's the same UI and it, and it does the same thing inside of Maya and Maya LT. So if you're a Maya LT user, I'm going to be using Maya for this tutorial. But if you're a Maya LT user, you should be able to follow along just as easily. And Stingray 1.3, which just came out in uh, June of 2016, has Apex Cloth support, initial support for it. There are some things that are still being worked on that you'll see in a future version of Stingray, but for now we do have initial support for Apex Cloth, and I'm gonna show you guys how to go ahead and set that up, get it all working inside of Stingray, and be able to start doing some really cool procedural animations for things like flags and capes, and any other object in your world that needs to have a cloth-like bounce to it uh, that is hard to animate manually, uh, it's really great physics. Um, the cloth simulation is really great for doing procedural animations like that that are that are really hard to do otherwise with manual animations. And it gives you a really nice believable look that uh, will really make your characters and any other objects in the world that have cloth like properties on them to really kind of look great. Let's go ahead and get started here using uh, an asset that we have from CD Projekt and that's Geralt from The Witcher. We'd like to thank those guys for letting us use their asset here. And what I've done is I've basically created a cape for Geralt here and he his cape is an, is basically a cape with full thickness. It's not just a one-sided object and uh, that will come into play when we do some work on the cloth itself using the plugin. Um, and I'll explain that when we get to it. But uh, it's a real simple cape. It just kind of attaches at his shoulders. Now before we can actually do cloth simulation we have to make sure that the cape is bound to the skeleton of our character here. So you can see right now that this cape is not bound to him at all. So we're going to go ahead and do that first. So this is you know pretty straightforward. You will just select the cape and we'll select the joint that we want to bind it to. In this case it's going to be the upper chest of Geralt here. And we'll go to our skin menu and choose bind skinned options. I want to make sure I'm using geodesic voxel binding and we'll just hit bind skin with all the default settings here. It's not real important how how it's bound to the character in this case because we're going to be simulating the entire cape using NVIDIA's Apex Cloth. All right, so we're bound to our mesh now. And um, before we proceed, let's go ahead and basically paint the skin weights on it. So we'll go ahead to skin, paint skin weights. And what I want to do is um, I'm going to bring up the skin weights options here. And I'm just going to go ahead and flood it. I want to flood the entire thing to my torso joint there. And we'll just click the flood button, and there we go. So now we're fully bound, the cape is fully bound to the torso joint of Geralt, and we can go ahead and create our skin now. All right, so to create the skin, we'll just select the cape and go to the physics menu at the top, choose physics clothing, create clothing. And you can see on the right side there in the attributes panel, we've got all of our clothing options. I'm just going to hit the paint button under physics, physical material, so that I can go ahead and paint the skin weights, or I should say the, the simulation weights for my cloth. So I'm going to set the value here between 0 and 120 on the uh, tools setting here on the left. And 120 is going to be my maximum weighting. And I'm going to paint that at the bottom of the cape using the paintbrush here. And what this means is this part of the cape, the bottom part that's white, will be able to move up to 120 units away from its original position in any direction. All right, and so we're going to paint both sides of the cape because, as I said, the cape is a multi-sided object here. It's, it's got actual thickness. So it looks a little more believable uh, rather than just something that, that is infinitely thin. All right, and uh, this doesn't have to be perfect. I'm just trying to match up both sides for the most part here, but we're going to blend all these together when we're done. So it doesn't have to be perfect exactly where I paint this. All right, and bear in mind, remember when you're using the paintbrush, you can hold down um, the B key, and while you're holding the B key down, you can change the size of your brush. You can, you know, mouse click and, and, and left and right, and it'll change the size of the brush while you're holding the B key down. All right, now I've changed my value to 60, and I'm painting again uh, kind of the middle area of the cape, and this means that the middle area of the cape will not be able to move quite as far as the bottom of the cape. It's going to be able to move about 60 units in any direction. Uh, and again, this doesn't have to be perfect. It's going to all be blended together. Okay. And uh, next up, I think we'll go ahead and paint at a value of about 30. So, but what you can see here, what I'm doing, Mike, is I'm basically cutting the value in half each time. So we started at 120. Now, we, then we went down to 60. Now we're cutting that in half and we're at 30. And you can see that the gray tone values here basically represent 
uh, how much give that the cape will have in the cloth simulation, how far it will be able to move. And as I move up the t to the top of the cape, I want it to be able to move less and less. So obviously at the very top, it's going to be pinned to the character and we don't really want it to move at all. All right. You can see here I'm changing my brush size again, just holding down the B key to do that and moving the mouse while I'm holding down the mouse button. Now we're painting at a value of one. So there's very, very little influence here. In other words, the, this part of the cape will only be able to move about one unit in any direction in the simulation. Okay, and just make sure we paint the whole thing on both sides. And originally I was thinking I was going to leave the very top of the cape unsimulated. So that's what the, the pinkish purplish color is. That means it's completely unsimulated. And I'm, I was going to leave it there, but uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and, and just paint those values in. So right now let's go ahead and smooth it out. So I've changed my brush to smooth and increased the size drastically. And I'm just painting over it and smoothing those values together so they're not such a hard um, break between them. All right, and so we can see here as I'm smoothing it out, it's it's also kind of smearing the the lowest value uh, up, you know, along the unsimulated area, the the purple pink area. Uh, and you might as well just call that a value of zero, the purple pink area. That means it will not be simulated at all. Now, there's one thing to bear in mind, kind of a gotcha here, uh, not really a gotcha, but uh, if you are having trouble visualizing anything in the viewport in Maya or Maya LT. Uh, with physics and there there are certain certain parts of using physics that won't visualize you might you might have seen earlier I was playing around with the paint visualizer settings uh, I was changing the visualization mode and nothing was happening and that's because for whatever reason the current version of the NVIDIA physics plugin seems to have some trouble in viewport 2.0 displaying the um, the nodes and so forth properly the helpers so if you do have that issue where things aren't displaying, just change your renderer in the viewport between viewport 2.0 and one of the legacy viewports like legacy high quality or, or legacy standard. And then it will, it will pop into view. You'll be able to see the helpers and you can switch back and it'll work in viewport 2.0 as well. So not sure what, why that is. It just seems to be um, having some trouble, at least on my particular setup, I'm using a quadro card. NVIDIA Quadro card. Um, it's not one of the newer Quadros. It's a K Kepler. Uh, it's not one of the uh, the M model cards. So that could have something to do. It could be a driver issue. I'm not really sure. But uh, if you do have the same problem that I had, just, just toggle your viewport settings in the renderer options um, right above the viewport and that should, should fix it for you. All right, so we've done the initial paint job and we're gonna go ahead and do a quick simulation here under the physics menu. Just click play simulation. And you can see here, it's it's simulating the object as uh, the timeline goes, but we're getting a lot of collision here, uh, clipping, I should say, through Geralt. And that's not what we want. The cape is just going right through him. So we're going to need to set him up so that that doesn't happen anymore. We want to make sure that the cape bounces off of his body appro appropriately as he moves or animates, uh, rather than going through him there, obviously. Now, bear in mind that the current support for cloth sim in Stingray 1.3 does not support collision. So we're going to go ahead and set our character up for collision anyway in anticipation of getting collision support in Stingray. Uh, and to do that, we're going to go ahead and basically select the mesh objects of our character and apply uh, ragdoll physics uh, using NVIDIA's physics plugin. So we'll start out, we'll select the, the, the main body mesh here of the character. And if we'll you know, basically select any mesh that you want to have collision. So I'm just going to select uh, everything on Geralt here except for his hands. Uh, and then all we have to do to uh, apply the collision is go to the physics menu under ragdolls, choose create kinematic ragdoll. Okay, and that brings up the attribute editor over here on the right. Uh, it only chose the first mesh I selected, so I'm going to scroll down under Rig Tools, Source Meshes, click Add, and we're going to go ahead and add in the other meshes that I had wanted. So we'll start with the legs here. We'll add that in and select the Ragdoll Locator and the output Outliner there and click the Add button again. And we'll add uh, the rest of the meshes again. We need to make sure the chest is added, the legs are added, and um, the feet. Okay, and we'll just hit the update rig button and that will update the rig for us using the new meshes. And you can see here that it creates this, um, basically uh, all of these helper objects, they look like spheres in this case, or capsules is what they really are, 
uh, around the mesh object. Since what we're doing now under the joint setup is we're removing all of the joints that we don't want to have a uh, collision on them. I don't want any collision on his hands or arms. So I'm basically just going through the list here under joint setup and just selecting them. And when after I select them, I just hit the remove button. And you can see it's updating in the viewport there. It's removing the capsules from those objects. Now remember, if you did your update rig and it didn't show you capsules, uh, just cycle your viewport using the renderer uh, drop down above your viewport and that will allow you to see these capsules. Anytime that happens, just cycle the viewport and uh, it'll it'll fix that issue. So we'll just continue to go through these joints here in the joint setup list and just continue to click remove until all of these capsules that I don't want are removed. And you can change between capsules and also I believe mesh, triangle mesh so that it's more accurate. Uh, but just bear in mind that triangle mesh obviously is going to be more expensive uh, to test against collision uh, because basically it mimics the exact shape of your character whereas the capsules are much more simple approximations of the character in this case and I think that's gonna work out just fine for us alright just continuing to remove these joints here and uh, you could technically go through the outliner and simply select these helper objects on these joints and delete them as well but I I think I tried that originally and it didn't seem to work very well. So this is the proper way to remove these joints from your ragdoll. All right, and we'll just go ahead and get rid of these toe joints as well down here. Uh, the toe capsules, I should say, getting rid of them from the joints that they're connected to. All right, so we're almost down to what, uh, what we need and what we don't need, getting rid of those. Looking good. So a very simple skeleton here, obviously. I probably should have gone ahead and put collision uh, on his upper arms at the bare minimum. There are situations where his arms might actually bounce against the, uh, or animate against the cape uh, or vice versa, but uh, I decided just for this test case, I'm going to go ahead and leave his arms with no collision. And we'll just focus on his torso and his legs now. All right, so that looks good. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to use the outliner to select these rigid bodies one at a time. And you'll see under each shape node, you've got a rigid body node. And if you click that, it's going to bring up the attribute editor panel for it. And just select select transform in the attribute editor at the top. And that'll allow you to actually manipulate that helper object, that rigid body. And what I just want to do is kind of basically move them around and scale them so that they fit the body shape a little better. Like you can tell on the, the thigh here that it's not quite uh, fitting that well. It's a little too big and it's it might not be properly angled. So we'll just use the attribute editor here to change the, the uh, height and radius of it. And you can see here by changing the viewport from the viewport 2.0 to something more of a legacy viewport, this will allow me to see my changes more accurately as I, as I change the radius and height of the object. All right, so now that we've got everything kind of the size and shape and location that we want, we'll select the ragdoll node above his head here. And if we go down under the, at the very bottom under source meshes, rig tools, we can actually mirror our changes. So in here we'll just choose uh, L underscore for the source and R underscore for the ones we want mirrored to and just hit the mirror button. And now we have uh, all of the changes we made on the left side are now also on the right side. That way we didn't have to do it all manually. So now we just need to go through the torso objects and make sure that uh, they are all properly sized and in the right location. And just again adjusting their transforms and their radiuses and heights until they kind of fit the body shape of our character. Obviously the the main torso object there is is a lot bigger than it should be so we're gonna scale that way down that could basically represent his chest there and uh, I might actually end up going through here and adding another capsule for his torso uh, at some point but uh, I think for now this is gonna work and of course his shoulders are way too big and we're gonna need to adjust the shoulder capsules as well and just, you know, we're not trying to do this so that it's perfect. We just want to make sure it's lined up fairly well so that the collision of the cape looks close enough to realistic uh, that it will be believable. Again, just cycling the viewport here to get my displays to look correctly. 
So here I'm just changing the radius and height in the attribute editor here of the left shoulder rigid body so that it fits a little better. And we'll select the transform and move it a little more into place. It doesn't really matter the orientation of the capsule. It can be rotated any direction you want. It's just the point that the capsule is there. That's all that really matters. So if you want to rotate your capsule to 90 degrees to one direction or just leave it the way it was created automatically by physics, that's entirely up to you. It's all about what fits the best on your mesh. All right, so let's go ahead and do a quick simulation to see how our collision works. And right out of the gates, you can see that something's not right here. Something's definitely not right. The cape is just balling up on his back. So we need to do one more thing here to get this to work. So what we're going to do is we need to also remember the cape has thickness. It's not just a, a flat object with no thickness. It's got two sides. So what we need to do is select our cape object, go back to the paint tool, and we need to let physics know which side of the object will be driven by the other side. And right now, the... Um, Physics is simulating both sides of the object. Now, not only is that more expensive because it's basically double the amount of faces, the double of the amount of verts that it's simulating, it's causing some issues with our simulation. So first of all, under the paint tool, I'm gonna go ahead and just paint these guys so that they have a, a value of one. So they are slightly simulated, but not by much. Uh, I probably could have left those at zero, um, but I wanted to go ahead and just, just go ahead and apply, make sure that everything on the cape had some value to it for the simulation. Now that I've done that, we're going to go ahead and change from max distance to latch to nearest. And what we're going to do is we're going to have the inside of the cape being the latch side. In other words, the inside verts of the cape are going to be latched to the outside verts of the cape. They will not be simulated. Instead, the outside verts will drive them. So all we're going to do is use the paintbrush with latch to nearest, and we're going to paint a full value uh, on the inside here. We want to make sure not to paint any of the verts on the outside though. So just be careful as you're painting that you do not, you you're, are not able to see any of the outside verts of the cape or whatever object it is that you're painting. So we'll just go ahead and continue here to paint these verts. Uh, we're, we have an edge right now. We're going to go ahead and make sure that we get that edge painted as well. And just paint all around it. You can see the out, the outside is still black. We want to keep it that way for the time being. All right. And just paint, making the brush smaller so that we don't affect too many verts at this point. Start with a big brush so that you can get the large areas and then, you know, make your brush smaller and then paint the edges here so that we don't go to the other side. Okay. And this is going to solve our problem. You can see I kind of painted over the edge there. I'm going to have to fix that. This is going to solve our problem of the cape balling up on his back like that, not, not simulating properly, as well as making the simulation more efficient because we're only simulating one side of the cape. So while we're wrapping this up, I might add there are a lot of settings in the physics material itself that you can change that will affect how the material responds, how bouncy it is, how much friction there is, uh, to give you anything from really heavy linens to silk to any kind of material that you can probably imagine just by changing those settings. And um, we're not going to change any of those for this example. I'm just going to leave them all at default. Um, and uh, I'll let you guys play around with those settings on your end to come up with the result that you want to come up with. But I think I got a pretty good result just using the default settings for a cape here. All right, almost done painting the inside, the latch side of our cape. Just rounding out the rest of these edges here so that they're all fully painted. All right, I think that's going to do it for the inside of the cape. Looks nice and solid. And we'll just check the outside to make sure that none of those edges were painted and it looked clean for, from here. So now we're going to change the brush to the drive option under paint value and we're going to paint the outside the same way we painted the inside. So you can see when we change to the drive option, the inside turns pink uh, and that is to indicate that it is not in any way uh, the driver. So it's got a value of zero as it should. All right, and we'll just paint the outside now. And the cool thing is, is since the inside was already painted as the latch side, 
anything that we do here is not going to, to affect the inside. We're not going to accidentally overspray onto the inside because it's already locked to the other value, to the latch value. You can see there it stays clean no matter what we do on the outside. So we don't have to worry about overspray here. All right, which means I can use a big brush to get it depainted a lot quicker. All right. That all looks good. Just doing a last minute check to make sure everything is painted properly here. Great. So now we're ready to do another test simulation. So let's go ahead and uh, we're going to hide the, the, uh, the joints in this case. But before we do, we want to actually animate the joints. So we're going to bend them over at the waist here. Just provide a simple animation so that we can see the uh, effect of the cloth simulation on an animated object. And I'm just going to bend his leg. Uh, as well and uh, nothing you know I, I'm not gonna create a walk cycle or anything for the time being we're just gonna do some real simple stuff just to kinda test it out but obviously the point is is if you have walk cycles or runs or any other animations that your character would have in a game uh, the cloth simulation will will respect those animations and uh, that's the whole point of this alright so we've got our simple animation and we'll go ahead and hide our joints again and we're ready to do our test simulation. So we'll go to the physics menu, play stop simulation, and we can see our animation happens and the cloth is beautifully animating and colliding with our character. Looks great. All right, let's go ahead and uh, rewind our simulation. Now there's another thing we can do. We, if we go into the cloth object here in the attribute editor, choose our cape clothing, scroll down to the very bottom, you're going to find um, an advanced attributes rollout here and we can actually add some wind. So I'm going to set my wind direction and wind eval to 45 degrees and wind velocity I'm going to set at a thousand here and we'll go ahead and play the simulation again and uh, actually first let's go to global settings and under global settings we'll do loop without rewind. Alright and now we can play the simulation and now you can see we have a nice wind blowing again it's at 45 degrees and you can always change that value to whatever you want. It could be probably tied in with scripting in your game engine to determine which direction the wind is blowing from if you wanted to. Uh, but it gives you a really nice effect there. Looks really good. And it's got self-collision and with itself, it's colliding properly with the mesh of the character. Uh, looks fantastic. All right. So that's pretty much the setup for your cloth objects inside of Maya or Maya LT. And uh, it takes a little work, but uh, the results are well worth it. I mean, it definitely looks fantastic. That's something that would be really hard to animate manually. And that's what's so great about procedural animation like physics cloth. So now we just need to export it to our game engine. We're going to go to export all under the file menu and we'll browse to our Stingray project. I have a simple project set up here. And I'm just going to, under my content directory, I'm going to create uh, a characters folder. And inside the characters folder, we'll go ahead and uh, create another folder. I think we'll probably create a folder and we'll just call it, oh, The Witcher. How about that? All right. And inside The Witcher folder, this is where we'll save our guy, Geralt. And we need to change the file type to FBX, of course. And just check the default settings here of FBX. They should be fine. I, I'm not going to bake any of my animations. Uh, everything looks the way it should be. All right. And we'll just go ahead and hit export. All right. We can ignore these warnings here. All right. So before it'll work in Stingray, we also need to export the physics file. So we'll go back to export all. And in this case, we're going to change our file type to physics down at the bottom there. There you go. Physics. And it needs to be named exactly the same as the FVX file, so Geralt. And we want to check Export Physics Assets under Physics Clothing. Uh, and we want to make sure Miocene units are centimeters and physics is set to meters. And we'll export that, jump over to Stingray. We need to import the FBX asset from our Witcher folder. So we'll right click Import Asset and of course browse to our characters, the Witcher, Geralt.FBX and import that. When Stingray imports it, it's going to automatically create it's a file for physics using the physics file that we exported from Maya. So we do want to import the animation and skeleton, so we'll make sure that that's checked. Uh, all right, everything looks good here. All the basic default settings here that we're bringing him in with. 
All right, so Stingray will do its thing. You can see at the bottom right there, it's importing the asset and uh, compiling it. And uh, once it's done, we need to do a few other things um, to get it working. Now, bear in mind that this is initial support for physics clothing in Stingray. So there isn't a UI yet. And some of the things we're going to have to do are going to be done manually in the physics file. We're going to have to do a little typing, not much. So if we go into the Witcher folder here, we can see that we've, we've got a Geralt.physics file that's been created on import. If we open that physics file, you can see there's a, there's a lot of stuff in here under physics scene of, of all the rigid bodies, but there's no data for them yet. And that's because we currently are not importing the rigid body information. So there's not going to be any collision yet, but I expect to see that in a newer, uh, more uh, future version of Stingray. But what we need to do in here is add this apex equals apex underscore cloths equals uh, and we're going to do uh, open and close square brackets and inside that open and close curly braces and we need to specify the resource location for our object and the source mesh so under resources we're going to put the relative path to the Geralt FBX file so content slash character slash the witcher slash Geralt you don't need the dot FBX then we have source underscore mesh equals cape and cape is just the name of the mesh object that we had in Maya or Maya LT um, and that's it so now we need to go into the settings INI file as I brought up here in our project you're gonna find that in the root of your project and you need to add this this bit here that says physics equals apex cloth equals true and so forth so just pause the video if you need to to know what that is again and uh, it's just three lines you just need to make sure that that basically enables physics cloth for your project also we need to select the cape shader and disable normal mapping currently there is no support for normal mapping on the the cape uh, on the physics cloth so we need to delete that off out of our shader just select all of the normal map related stuff and as you can see here and then just delete it right out of the shader okay and I'm sure in the future version that will be fixed but for now uh, we do not support normal maps and as soon as we do that we should see our cape in the in the editor and it is fully simulating so I can now grab Geralt and it's playing in the viewport and uh, moving around as our cape did inside of Maya or my LT and just remember we don't have collision yet so that's why you're seeing it colliding through his body but that will be solved in a future version all right uh, one other caveat is that you might want to check your default shading environment if anything looks blurry uh, there's a good chance that you're using motion blur in your shading environment and I believe that currently with uh, the rendering environment apex cloth does not uh, it's not supported with blurring motion blurring enabled so you'll want to disable that as well all right so just remember this is an initial support for apex cloth and stingray they will be working on it to add more support for collision and, and uh, solving issues like normal mapping and whatnot uh, look for that in future versions of stingray uh, I hope this tutorial has been helpful for you uh, if you have any questions at all feel free to leave them uh, on my blog post and uh, I'll get to those questions as soon as I can all right, and so thank you guys for watching, and we'll be doing more tutorials on Stingray 1.3 features. Uh, next up, I'll be doing a tutorial on the new particle-based system, which uses shader effects for the billboards of your particles, and uh, it's going to give you a lot more power and flexibility on and how to make those particles uh, look the way you want them to look. And uh, all right, so thanks for watching, guys. We'll catch you next time.